Welcome back inside the No Morning Show, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy that you're here with us still. And guess what? I have a special surprise for you this morning. I know you've been begging, you've been asking, you've been wondering, when is Natalie coming back? Ladies and gentlemen, Natalie Legros is here with us. Good morning, sunshine. Good morning, Rockers. Good morning. And I see you have Sorala there with you. Good, Good morning, morning, Natalie. And to all of our lovely people on social media, in front of their televisions, abroad. Uh, Thank God for all of you. We appreciate you. Trust me. I know that right. they, 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 they miss you bad, Natalie. They was asking for you for the last two weeks. They said, when Natalie, oh God, well, when Natalie coming back, I can't take rockers no more. Oh, Lord. Listen, don't listen to them because, you know, when I'm there, they quarrel the same way. <laughs> when I'm there, they quarrel the same way. So you don't worry yourself. But all right. so much is happening this week, guys. Of course, you know. By the way, congratulations to Terence Dialsing and Fitzgerald Hines, who had their vaccination drive this weekend gone, you know, getting the people out to get the Pfizer and the Sinopharm and the AstraZeneca and the Johnson and Johnson. So I thought that was very good. I, I appreciate the fact that they're trying to mobilize their people and get them vaccinated. If we need to see more ministers, opposition MPs do that. And I heard you all talking about the little child who got mauled to death by the dog. And it's just one of those sad stories, you know, that you just never, ever, ever, every time you hear a story like this, you get upset, you feel hurt, you feel angry. And I'm just hoping that, you know, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Last night, Auntie Alison and I were speaking about it. And I'm saying, maybe we just have to try and, you know, Try, try to discipline the children because dogs will be dogs. So that, you know, if you tell a child, don't go outside or don't move, the child doesn't. Because I felt so hurt when I saw that story last night. I'm telling you, it was... But what to do? It definitely was devastating. And it is a, is a situation that, I mean, no family ever wants to be in. Uh, because, yes. but, you know, I also feel not like, you know, we, we tell the you tell any child, don't go outside by the dog. Um, but why do we have the dog? Is it that we need the dog for protection? Is it that the dog supposed to be a, a friend of the family? How does it work? Because I, I don't understand it. And, you know, I have questions about whether we choose the dog or the child. Yeah. And I remember speaking to a dog handler. I can't remember the current terminology, but I'm going to call him a dog handler. About this very thing um, when we had a, a situation similar to this some time ago. And, you know, of course, you know, remember... Remember, we had quite a few of these, and I think legislation was brought forward to categorize dogs, to see what dogs are considered dangerous dogs. Yep. What, but the reality is that dogs have personalities, and dogs go through moods and attitudes just as human beings, as far as I can see. You know what I mean? And if a dog is unfamiliar with somebody, or if a dog feels threatened, regardless of whether it's a potong, or a Rottweiler, or a pit bull, is that we can find ourselves in danger. So then I think the conversation has to shift now to how to protect ourselves. And you're right, why do we need these dogs? I don't know, because I wouldn't want a dog that is considered a dangerous dog. Well, some people, some people seem to have no problem with it. But I Natalie, um, it is now, what time is it now? It's a little bit after 6, 24 minutes past 6 o'clock. So I think uh, we could shift the conversation a little bit to talk about what's happening with regards to schools, uh, the SEA results, the teachers, and the reopening of schools, as you have your spotlight on now. All right, welcome back to the No Morning Show here on TPP. It's 25 minutes after the hour of 6 o'clock. Thank you all so much for joining us. And we wanted to go back to just a few days when the SEA results came out and some family members, teachers, principals, parents, students were excited. And of course, you know, we normally grapple with the usual disappointments with some. But coming out of the SEA results, one of the things we learned from the Minister of Education is that there was an overall 6.1% decrease in grades, in SEA grades. 
And I think it is said that it was because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm going to welcome the president of the Trinidad and Tobago Unified Teachers Association, Antonia Tita de Freitas, to talk to us about those SEA results. And not only that, we are in a new school term, a new year, a new school year under the pandemic and just how we are faring. Good morning to you, Mr. Speaker de Freitas. Good morning, Natalie. Good morning to your listeners and viewers. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us, darling. So the SEA results. So while we may have had a little bit better grade with mathematics when it came on to language arts, creative writing and language arts is that the grades were less and we saw more people, more students were scoring below the 30% marker. How does Tutor feel about these results? Well, as an association, I want to say it first of all, as an association, we've consistently said for the last few years that we need to do away with the high stakes assessment that's called the SEA, previously called the common entrance. We have recognized it does nothing for our students mentally, physically, emotionally, good, except to place them in a secondary school to allow them to try. And we have advocated repeatedly that there has to be another way to have our students transition in a more humane manner, for want of a better term, from primary to secondary. Understandably, though, given the circumstances of 2020 and 2021 with the pandemic, she would want to congratulate the students on their accomplishments, all students. The fact that all students were able to go and sit in the exam room at 11 or 12 years and complete or do the best that they could have is an accomplishment in itself. So we commend them for that. Um, Natalie, one of the things we in this country, we are built around exams, we are built around the prestige, we are built around high achievers. So congratulations to those students who achieved the successes they wanted to achieve. However, that doesn't hold for everybody and it has never done so. One yeah. of the things we must consider is that the pandemic circumstances have thrown up situations in our education system that need to be addressed. We look at the results, it has been stated that there are, there are declines in performance. What did we expect? Did we realistically expect something different? Um, and therefore, are we going to identify those students as collateral damage? Are we going to be reactive now and throw diagnostic tests? Where is the problem? Or are we going to sit down now, finally, Natalie, and systematically plan for education for the next two or three years? Since this pandemic, we have had a national consultation on education uh, some months back since the pandemic started. Are you suggesting that this is not sufficient in trying to chart that way forward to systematically sit down and plan education for Trinidad? No, it's not. It, it, it's not, not, it, not. It's not because consultation doesn't necessarily mean it has to occur in the public domain, in purview of John Public um, all the time. Consultation will also mean that you sit with the education researchers, you sit with the practitioners, the professionals, the teachers, the principals, the curriculum officers, the school supervisors, etc., and you hear what these people have to say and you see what their recommendations are. That has not happened in a meaningful way. Tutor going to a meeting with the Ministry of Education or tutor making a pronouncement in the media does not mean that things are going the way that they should. And I want to make this point, Natalie, 17 years, 17 months, sorry, at the start of the pandemic, we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know how we were going to deal with this. 12 months, things changed. As of three months ago, we didn't even imagine we would have been able to vaccinate some students to have them return to school. So the issue of discussion, of dialogue, of consultation on a consistent basis must be considered and must be forefront as circumstances change for individuals and the society during this particular period. And therefore, I will reiterate that planning for this, this new education system and the new academic year cannot be done in the public domain. It cannot be done by simply saying we had a meeting. It requires discussion on all of the areas that will affect our education. Just as you were speaking with your, with your co-host, 
um, before we came on about the situation with the young child and the dog, and we would want to extend condolences to that family. There are multiple dimensions in that situation. Some of us have been very clear to us, and some of us, some of it, you know, we may have to dig a little deeper. The same you know, one of the things I know, I know that consultations are important, and I'm actually happy that the Ministry of Education had it had extended those consultations to the public because a lot of times we have these high level meetings with the stakeholders and what's coming out of those are not necessarily you know reflective of what the society wants and i think the societal perspective is really important as well but with over the years with all the stakeholders meeting that we've had isn't it telling us something then about you know, just how we're able to, 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 to form consensus, because I'm positive that the Ministry of Education has had numerous, countless meetings with stakeholders, be it, you know, tutor, be it principals association, be it researchers, be it the technocrats. So why are we constantly having these meetings and still landing in the same place? Well, that is a question, Natalie, that will be better placed, I guess, at the level of the policy makers. You know, as a student of public policy of government, well, one of the first tenets you learn is that governments will do what governments will have to do, regardless of, of whether John Public may say A, B, or C. And sometimes, many times, governments seek to do what's in the best interest of the public good. Other times, again, they may just make a decision without the necessary dialogue. I want to draw a reference, Natalie, and make a comparison. Last week, we had reporting on a, a new housing development or the continuation of a housing development to take place in St. Augustine in Pira. And that project is earmarked to utilize some of the St. Joseph Farm, what we know as the St. Joseph Farm. Now, yeah. urban planners will tell you that, okay, there have to be green spaces, even in suburban and urban communities. This is arable land. Is there no other place within that particular environment to, to do that kind of project? We have to reach the point where people have to protest and people have to make noise. And the point I'm making, Natalie, is that consultation has to be a two-way process. We talk about tripartism. We talk about hearing stakeholders and hearing the public. It's a listening and the sharing as well and proper communication. And but, there's but, maybe in process in... in policy does implementation, that's where we're falling short. Does Tuta take any responsibility for the changes that we saw in those grades with the students? I am not sure that Tuta as an association should take responsibility for that because just as I mentioned earlier, there will be multiple dimensions to how we have dealt with the situation. The virtual engagement that we have had our students or most of our students exposed to is not one that is beneficial to all students. Children, people learn differently, as we know. And therefore, as educators, we have tried the best that we can. In any profession, there may be some persons who will need further support, greater support. But when you have situations, naturally, where the educators are utilizing their own devices and they don't have support, where you have situations where the, the children are still lacking in devices and connectivity that will allow them to meaningfully and consistently access the, the educational opportunities. That's not tutor's responsibility. That's the responsibility of other parties in the society. Our responsibility is to make sure that the teachers are properly benefiting. And two, that the student or the education system is not challenged and that we do not further exacerbate in inequities that we have seen. So oh, the reason I ask, Mrs. DeFreitas, is that TUTA as an organization represents teachers. And at the heart of the learning of these students are teachers who are engaging with them. And since the pandemic, we've focused a lot of our energies on, you know, the devices and the connectivity and the ministry, what the Ministry of Education is doing. But what of the role of the teachers, though, in all of this? Because, you know, we see, you know, we hear the stories of, okay, safe working environment, what's considered safe, where's us compliant, you know, how teachers are supposed to interface with students, and we are at another school year, a new term has begun, and I'm just trying to figure out if we're going to be continuing after 17 months of the pandemic, if we're just going to continue along the same vein without changing anything at the level of the teachers, understanding now what it takes or what it might take 
to get those students to perform. So your question again is multidimensional and hopefully I can answer or attend to all the dimensions. Let's talk about the role of educators and we're not just talking teachers in the classroom. We are talking yeah. about administrators, we're talking about school supervisors, our curriculum officers, our personnel at student support services division, all who lend support to our students. Each one of those education categories has a different role and function. How effectively we function will determine, of course, as you are suggesting, the results or the output of the student. So the teacher in the classroom will come on, log on on time, and call the role. And Natalie, where are you? Natalie, could you put on your camera? Natalie, yeah. preparing you. And probably 15 minutes into the class, Natalie comes up. And Natalie comes on with a very sour face and a grumpy face. And then halfway in the class, you have Natalie called away from the class because mommy wants her to go and do something, some task. Now, that may not happen in all circumstances, but it has happened frequently, frequently enough from our anecdotal data to disrupt the child's learning process. The teacher sends work home via Zoom, via WhatsApp, via whatever modality, email, whatever. And it's not done. One may argue, well, parents are expected to do more. Parents are expected to teach. Parents are not expected to teach. Parents are expected to supervise and support. So when the teacher sends the work home, whatever modality, and it's not done, and it's like pulling teeth, we have these challenges, right? The students themselves have to be motivated. The parents have to continue to support the students. Successes of those students from last week came from those who were in environments where you had the, the capacity to motivate. But when my parents' choice is between an internet package, Natalie, and food on the table, when my parents' choice is between staying home with me and going to work to earn an income, these are things of impact. And teachers have been trying to maneuver and manipulate. Let us look now at the teachers themselves. We have a all right, hear what I'm saying to you. All right, as tutor, as an organization, mm -hmm. is there any assessment of teachers to see their performances to see, you know? Well, I, I, I was coming to that. I was coming to that. System of yes. matriculation, whether we like it, yes or no, no, where, you know, we look at those who are achieving. And we, as I said, the focus always seems to be on the students. But what of the teachers? Do so, we look so let me, yeah, so. Going beyond the call of duty, who is the Ah, that, that's it. That's it. And who is looking at that? The standards of the call of duty. Who, who, is, who is looking at that? Who is monitoring that? Simply saying, teachers, thank you, bye, by the employer. We have teachers, as I was going to indicate, we're talking about monitoring. We have educators who have not been receiving their correct salary. And I'm not talking about salary negotiations. And people say teachers home and only collecting salary. I'm not talking about that. We have teachers who graduated, for example, from the teachers' training institution since 2010 and have been receiving that salary, and they are not deemed permanent teachers. 2010 to now, and you are teaching a class, which means you've taught a couple hundred of students already with much success, but you are expected to go above and beyond. We have teachers who are living in situations and communities where they have to leave home or they go to school and the school still does not have connectivity. So they have to steal from the, the bar next door because the bar has one of those open Wi-Fi systems. We have teachers who will, even at the start of this term, purchase their books, purchase their material to furnish or to equip their virtual classroom, all without compensation additional support. Many of our teachers, when the pandemic started, had to do the training and navigate virtual engagement on their own. The training offered by the ministry has been limited. Tutor has stepped in to lend support where we can, but yeah. yes and truly, we have to look at the course, we still need some money. Provide, exactly. Provide the worker with the tools, the training, the professional development, the resources needed to do the job. We are still in this paradigm, naturally, teachers home, they're not doing nothing, they're not teaching the children, they're drawing a salary. But with, if teachers stop teaching for one day, let's say tutor makes a call and teachers stop teaching tomorrow, virtual and otherwise, what happens? We look at the results and we talk about results. 
What happens? Who's forgetting into the result? Because we're, 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 just, just, let me just finish. What about CXC results? Are yeah. we going to talk about CXC's results when they come out? Are we going to say, who, look at who's responsible? Or are we simply going to blame it on the pandemic without listening to the teachers, what they are saying, and putting systems in place to mitigate the loss and the negative impact on students? That's the role of teachers we have to focus on. So let's let's talk about uh, March 2020, and now we are September 2021. From tutors' perspectives, have we had any changes for better in terms of how we maneuver the online platform, the online classroom, and you know, in, in, in regardless of what the results are saying, just in terms of on the ground, have we had any improvements in terms of how we operate in the pandemic online? in getting the students to learn? No. From our perspective, no. Because as I started by saying, we still have challenges with, you know, socioeconomic situations that children are not able to join. We still have challenges with students without devices and proper connectivity. We still have challenges where you are not able to adequately reach the child with special needs, the child who is doing a technical vocational subject, the child who's doing a VAPA subject, we have had challenges still naturally in terms of motivating some of these students to sit in front of a screen for three hours. The planning of the work is difficult. The doing of the homework by the children is difficult. And what we are seeing is that there has to be a different way. It cannot be that we come on and we sit in front of the screen for five, six hours, and therefore that is learning. We cannot transpose, as we've said repeatedly, what happened in the physical space into the virtual space. Your lessons have to be differentiated. Your approach has to be dynamic. Okay, so we have 30 seconds. What is that different way, apart from sitting in front of the screen for five to six hours? The different way, one of the different ways has to do with how we diversify our approach to curriculum delivery. In the first instance, we can't expect to deliver the entire curriculum as we would have done in the physical space. Curriculum has to be adjusted. We have to make sure that our parents and our students are properly oriented to online engagement because it's, it's here to stay. Whether we, we return to physical school or not, it's here to stay. And therefore we need to resource human, physical, financial resources and provide emotional support for parents, students and educators as well for the system to be effective. All right, Mrs. De Sica de Freitas Donna, thank you so much for speaking with us this morning. We're out of time. But of course, you know, with Peter, we'll continue to check in and see where we're at and continue with the discussion. Thank you very much for having me. Be safe, everyone, and continue to keep up the fight. Have a good day. Uh, thank you so much. Antonia Pika de Freitas, we're a tutor president talking to us about the FTE results and just how students are learning at this time. We take a break and we'll be back with you.